Blue Journey. Blue Journey. Good morning. It's so good to see you here in Apopka. We want to welcome you, especially if you're first time here, you're a brave soul getting out today. We're so grateful for that. I want to welcome our Lake County campus, Lake County. Give Pastor Russell Cushman a little extra love. It was his birthday yesterday, so give him a little extra love today. And I know with the, uh, oh, we'll clap for him too. That's for you, Pastor Russell. And I know with the, 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 the recent spike in COVID cases and the blustery conditions today, we have a lot of people joining us online from all over Central Florida, all over America, and really all over the world. We're welcome you. We're so glad that you're with us today. Several years ago, an online magazine asked the question, if you had to summarize your life in six words, what would they be? It was inspired by the legendary challenge posed to the famous American novelist Ernest Hemingway when he was asked to write a six-word story that resulted in his classic for sale, Baby Shoes Never Worn. The magazine was flooded with so many responses that the site almost crashed, and the responses were eventually turned into a book, the book entitled, Not Quite What I Was Planning. And it is filled with six-word memoirs by writers both famous and obscure. The memoirs range from funny to ironic to inspiring to heartbreaking. Here's a sample. One tooth, one cavity, life's cruel. Savior complex makes for many disappointments. Cursed with cancer, blessed with friends. That was not written by a wise old grandmother, but a nine-year-old boy with thyroid cancer. I like this one. The psychic said I'd be richer. <laughs> Actually, this author might be richer if they stopped blowing money on psychics. Here's one, not a good Christian, but trying. One more, thought I would have more impact. Certainly one person who had great impact was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose life and legacy our nation commemorates tomorrow. Dr. King said many significant things about America's long and painful struggle with racial equality, but perhaps none more enduring than these six words, content of character, not skin color. The challenge of the six word limitation is its demand to focus on what matters most, to capture briefly Something of significance, kind of like a proverb. John Ortberg writes, it's striking to think about what the characters of Scripture might write for their six-word memoirs. Abraham, left Ur, had baby, still laughing. <laughs> Jonah, no, storm, overboard, whale, regurgitated, yes. Moses, burning bush, stone tablets, Charlton Heston. <laughs> and for young people that don't know who Charlton Heston is, that's just sad. Adam, eyes open but can't find home. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, king was hot, furnace was not. <laughs> Noah, hated the rain, loved the rainbow. Mary, manger, pain, joy, cross, pain, joy. Prodigal son, bad, sad, dad glad, brother mad. <laughs> Zacchaeus, climb sycamore tree, short, poorer, happier. And finally, the good Samaritan, I came, I saw, I stopped. Not quite what I was planning. Is the six word memoir any of them could have written. In none of these cases would these characters have been able to predict what their lives would be. They were interrupted. They were offered enormous opportunities or threatened by ominous danger 
or both. Because this is how life works. This idea is at the heart of many of the Proverbs contained in chapter 16 of the book of Proverbs. Now, if you're just joining us, we've been in a daily teaching series on the biblical book of Proverbs called Daily Wisdom, and you can follow along with us on our Journey YouTube channel, youtube.com slash journey Christian. Today, we're on day 16, which means we're in chapter 16. Don't forget the three Daily Wisdom Challenges. Number one, I will read one chapter of the book of Proverbs every day, and we have a teaching online every day on our YouTube channel that you can follow along with. And by the way, haven't these teachers been great, especially our residents? I've been so proud of our residents and what they've been doing. They've done a great, great job this week. We saw a lot of lot of our residents this week. Number two, I will pick one verse from each chapter to commit to meditate on daily. So pick one verse out, and you're going to think about that. You're going to reflect on that. You're going to meditate on that daily. Number three, I will not take the daily wisdom challenge alone. I will share my journey with other people. Now, today's chapter 16. And before we jump into chapter 16, I want to give you a little bonus material, if I can, about the structure of Proverbs or how Proverbs is written. Proverbs is not a set of simple, catchy steps to a happy life. A proverb is a poetic art form that instills wisdom as you wrestle with it. So proverbs are written in a unique way from most of the other types of literature written in the biblical books. The most fundamental mark of Hebrew poetry is parallelism or a couplet. This is two phrases, two clauses, or two sentences brought into close connection with each other so that they modify and expand on each other. The book of Proverbs employs at least three distinct types of couplets, completive, comparative, and contrasting. And we can see all three of these different types in chapter 16. In completive couplets, the second statement completes the first. The first statement, while true in itself, doesn't offer a complete picture without the second. These couplets typically feature coordinating conjunctions like and or so. For example, Proverbs 16, 20, and 21 says, whoever gives heed to instruction prospers and blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. The wise in heart are called discerning and gracious words promote instruction. Now, as the name comparative couplet suggests, the two statements invite a comparison. These proverbs feature terms like better than, as so, or like so. For example, Proverbs 16, 19. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Finally, in a contrastive couplet, the key term is usually but. One statement contrasts with the other to show two sides of the same coin, as it were. The contrasting conjunction links the statements together, yet keeps the two ideas distinct. Each statement can stand alone, but together their message becomes more profound. There are three contrastive couplets that I want us to focus on today. The chapter, chapter 16, is bookended with two of them, meaning it's the first verse and the last verse in the chapter, and another one is sandwiched in between. So let's look at the first verse of Proverbs 16 and then the last verse of Proverbs 16. Verse one, to humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. Verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And tucked away in between those verses, is this classic text in verse nine. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord 
establishes their steps. One of the emerging themes that quickly jumps out to me from Proverbs chapter 16 is human planning and God's guidance. If we had to put it in a six-word memoir, I think it would be humans make plans, God establishes steps. Now, we know from our study in Proverbs so far that the biggest difference between people who flourish in life and those who don't is not money, it's not health, it's not talent, it's not connections, it's not looks, it's wisdom. It's the ability to make good decisions. Columbia researcher Sheena Iyengar has found that the average person makes about 70 conscious decisions every day. That's 25,550 decisions a year from big decisions like, is this the right person to hire? Is this the right house to buy? Is this the right amount of freedom to give your child at this age? To small decisions like, are we having chicken or fish for dinner? Does this shirt go with these pants? Or if you're working remotely from home, do I even need to wear pants today? <laughs> Over 70 years of making decisions totals 1,788,500 decisions. Albert Camus once said, life is the sum of all your choices. In other words, you put all those 1,788,500 decisions together and that's who you are. Or is it? Is there something or someone that is at work directing our steps and guiding our journey? I think the Proverbs writer is telling us it is. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Now, this introduces us to a long-standing theological tension that many brilliant scholars have been wrestling with since the beginning of the study of God, and I want us to wrestle with it a little bit today. Are you up for that? Well, you're doing it anyways. Here's the question. Is man responsible and accountable for his choices, or is God in charge of everything? And the answer, according to every biblical writer, is a resounding yes. This is not an either or. It's a both and reality. A theologian named D.A. Carson wisely su suggested the sovereignty responsibility tension is not a problem to be solved. Rather, it's a framework to be explored. So let's explore it. Upon being asked how he reconciled divine sovereignty and human responsibility, the legendary 19th century preacher from London named Charles Spurgeon simply replied, I do not try to reconcile friends. This is the starting point we must acknowledge in the Bible, divine sovereignty and human responsibility are not enemies. They're not even uneasy neighbors. They're not in an endless state of cold war with each other. They are friends and they work together. Let's look at a few scriptures to see how this friendship works. The first comes from the book of Nehemiah, one of my favorite Old Testament books like the book of Proverbs. Nehemiah chapter four, verse nine Nehemiah said this in his journal, and that's what the book of Nehemiah is. It's like a journal. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Hmm. We prayed to our God, posted a guard. Here's another one. Isaiah 38 tells us the story of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, who's suffering from a fatal disease, and he prays to God to heal him and not let him his life end as a result of this sickness. And God hears him. And he sends the prophet Isaiah to tell Hezekiah he's gonna get better. And he's actually gonna live for 15 more years. Hezekiah is thrilled. And then here's what the prophet Isaiah tells him to do. Prepare a poultice. It's kind of like a hot compress. Prepare a poultice of figs, apply it to the boil, and he will recover. So I pray to God for healing God answers, I will heal you. Now apply this medical treatment. 
I pray to God to protect us. God says, I'll fight for you. Now here's your weapon. Believe it or not, as unrelated as those two stories may sound, they're really illustrating the same thing. Both of these stories show us the indispensably intertwined doctrines of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Now, we, hear, we have a tendency to say this. If God's really protecting you, you don't need to post a guard. And if you post a guard, you don't need to rely on God, right? No. Or we say, if God's going to heal you, you don't need to take any medicine. And if you take medicine, you're not trusting God to heal you, right? Again, no. Let's look at another one of my favorite stories from the book of Acts. Paul's on his way to Rome by way of a ship. He's sailing under Roman guard who are taking him to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. So we have both soldiers and sailors aboard the same ship. The ship sails into a nasty storm, so nasty that the sailors on board despaired for their lives. And when seasoned sailors want to give up, you know it's a bad storm. An angel of the Lord appears to Paul and he gives him a message. And Paul relates the message to the crew. Here's the message. I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. That's the message the angel gave Paul to give the guys. No, no one on board this ship is going to die from this storm. Only the boat is going to perish. Wait, what? That doesn't make any sense. But it gets better. A little later on, the same story. Some of the soldiers are still feeling a little bit uneasy about the whole deal in spite of what Paul said, or maybe because of what Paul said. And they try to sneak away. They try to get into one of the little lifeboats attached to the ship. Paul gets word of this. He goes straight to the soldier in charge of him. And he says, if they leave the ship, we're all going to die. So Paul here is pitting the soldiers against the sailors, thus originating the Army-Navy rivalry. <laughs> right there in the Bible. Now, now, you say, wait a minute. Why didn't Paul say, hey, God promised nobody's going to die, so it doesn't really matter what a few sailors do. Go snorkeling if you want. Nobody's going to die. God said so, right? Take a lifeboat. Don't take a lifeboat. Who cares? On the one hand, Paul says, by way of prophecy from God, nobody's going to die. On the other hand, if they leave the boat, we're all going to die. What's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on here. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility are both being showcased in the same story. God is clearly in control here. He's so in control that he can save a whole boatload of people in the middle of a nasty storm at sea without a boat. But people are accountable for their actions. And they and everyone around them will pay a heavy price when they choose foolishly. If you only acknowledge one or the other of these indispensably intertwined truths, you're either going to be passive or you're going to be paralyzed. Paul was neither. Paul was at peace. Guys, God's got this. Don't be afraid. And don't leave the boat or bad things will happen. However, if you want to see the greatest example of this concurrent truth of God's sovereignty, and human responsibility, then you look at the cross of Jesus Christ. Here's how Peter explained it in the very first sermon ever preached after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. He said, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Peter is saying it was absolutely determined well ahead of time. Jesus Christ is going to die for the sins of humanity. In fact, the writer of Revelation goes so far as to proclaim that Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain from the foundation of the world. That was the plan and the will of God to rescue his rebellious creation. And yet, Peter says, those of you who nailed him to the cross are utterly responsible for what you did. You're guilty. What you did matters. And God's predetermined purpose will always prevail. 
And I know that intellectually, we wonder, how can both of those things be true? If God's in charge, what does it matter what I do? And if what I really do matters, then what happens as a result of it can't be really set in God's plan. Logically, these two things don't seem to be compatible. But I want you to understand how deeply practical this is in our everyday lives. Tim Keller says this. Now, this is going to take some of you back. He says, if you really believe that what you prayed changed what God was going to do, you should never pray again. You say, you need to explain that, Pastor. Keller explains what he means by telling an old joke. He says this, when you were 10 years old, you could remember that your five-year-old self was totally stupid. You know, all right? And when you're 15, you look back on what your 10-year-old self thought and believed and wrote, and you, how, how ignorant I was. When you turn 20, you think, what a jerk I was at 15. And when you're 30, you look back and you say, my 20-year-old self was a real jerk. Well, guess what, he says, you're a jerk right now. You just don't realize it. Therefore, if you really believe that your prayers change the will of God, you shouldn't pray again because you have no idea what the right thing is to pray for. How do you know? With your limited perspective and your self-focused agenda, what should happen? You don't. In fact, that's exactly what Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2 says. All a person's ways seem pure to them. But motives are weighed by the Lord. Listen to me. You don't know yourself unless you know that your motives are never pure. And they always seem better to you than they do the Lord. What fool, knowing how little we know and how totally self-absorbed we are by what little we know, would want to live in a universe where your future is totally and completely fixed by your choices apart from the supremely wise and overruling plan of God. That's why we say, when we pray, not my will be done, but your will be done. On the other hand, if you believe that everything is scripted and already predetermined, regardless of what you do, then you have no incentive to be diligent, to take risks, to make prudent choices, to be wise with your money, to be sexually faithful, to make good decisions about who you hang around with, and all the other various topics the book of Proverbs addresses. The Bible is crystal clear about these towering twin truths. What you do matters, but you don't need to live with the weight of the world on your shoulders because God is in charge. You need to know both of these truths to live wisely. If you live as only one of those things is true, either you're going to be paralyzed. You're not going to want to get out of bed in the morning. You're going to put too much emphasis on yourself and you're going to miss the beauty of God's amazing grace. Or you're going to be passive. You're going to sit around and do nothing while waiting on God to act on your behalf. God wants you to be neither paralyzed nor passive. He wants you to be at peace because your choices matter and he's in charge. Now, a lot of people have tried to illustrate how these seemingly contradictory and wild intellectual ideas can both be true at the same time. Here's an older famous illustration from a great scholar named A.W. Tozer. Tozer said, imagine that an ocean liner leaves New York bound for Liverpool, England. The destination of this ship has been determined, predetermined by the proper authorities. Nothing can change it. This is at least a faint picture of sovereignty, Tozer says. However, on board this ship are scores of passengers, and these people are not in chains. Neither are their activities determined for them by decree. They're completely free to move about as they will. They can eat, they can sleep, they can play, they can lounge about on the deck, they can read, they can talk all together as they please. But all the while, the great liner is carrying them steadily toward their predetermined port. Both freedom and sovereignty are present here, and they do not contradict each other. Tozer concludes, so it, so it is, I believe, with man's freedom and the sovereignty of God. And look at this great statement that he makes. The mighty liner of God's sovereign design keeps its steady course over the sea of human choices in history. Now, when you think about it, the truth about God's sovereignty and human accountability is both sobering and encouraging. The plans of the heart really do belong to us. They're our responsibility. 
If you do something stupid, if you do something wicked, if you do something selfish or something cruel, people are gonna hold you accountable, and they should. And God's gonna hold you accountable, and he should. The way God controls history does not force us to act. Your plans are your plans. That's the sobering part. And yet, all we do, every one of our steps, down to even something as seemingly trivial as the flip of a coin. That's like the casting of the lots was. It's like a flip of the coin, drawing the straws. All of that is part of his plan. Nothing happens that is not under God's rule and part of God's plan. Both of those things are true at the same time, and it's not like it's 50-50 or 60-40 or 80-20. No, your plans are your 100% your free choice, and they're also 100% factored in the plan of God. That's the encouraging part, because this seeming paradox, while impossible to completely fathom, is supremely practical. It gives you enormous incentive to take prudent personal initiative, because poor choices will create pain and trouble. And yet even when you fail to choose wisely, and you will fail to choose wisely many, many times, remember, you cannot mess up the purposes of God. God can even take your failings and weave them into his plan for you. You say, how can you say that? I didn't. Joseph did. You remember Joseph? If you weren't around last fall, I encourage you to go back. Listen, watch to the turning trauma into triumph series we did on Joseph. At the end of the book of Genesis, we read those great words that Joseph says to his brothers, the brothers who hated him, the brothers who brutalized him, the brothers who betrayed him, the brothers who sold him into slavery and then told the biggest lie in the history of Canaan to cover it up. After enduring years of trauma and trials and troubles in a foreign land because of what those guys did to him, Joseph comes face to face with them again in a mesmerizing, mysterious, riveting reunion scene. And do you remember what Joseph said to him? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. If anybody ever tried to mess up the purposes of God, Joseph's brothers surely did. And yet everything that happened, every evil, murderous, selfish, deceitful act was used by God, not caused by God, but used by God to accomplish his will for his covenant people. Here's what Joseph was saying. Never, ever, ever, ever think that God is not working. And at the same time, never, ever, ever think that you can figure out how exactly it is that God is working. Especially in the moment, in real time. Think about it. When did Joseph say that to his brothers? Almost 30 years later. Friends, it takes some time to reflect. It takes some maturity to understand how God's sovereign, overruling grace is at work even in the darkest times in our life. So what do we do about this? Three things as we wrap up. Number one, admit ignorance. When you're not smart like me, it's easy to do. Admit ignorance. Where scripture is clear, we should be too. But where it's not clear, friends, you're just guessing. Educated guesses, maybe. Wise guesses, possibly, but guesses nonetheless. The Bible doesn't tell me God's sovereign will in a particular tragedy. So don't pretend otherwise. Courageously declare the bold and the clear. Cling to the truth that God's providential purposes are always good, but freely and humbly admit our ignorance about God's specific purpose in a specific circumstance. Say this, I, I, I know that God is good, but I don't know right now how this is good. Or say something like this, I don't know why this happened, but in light of the cross of Jesus, I know it can't be because he doesn't love me because he didn't spare his only son. I know it can't be because he isn't with me because Jesus said, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Going any further, guessing at anything deeper often leads to folly. Number two, Accept responsibility. Now, I want you to listen carefully. God's sovereignty doesn't eliminate human responsibility. It grounds it. 
In fact, it guards it. Think about it. If God weren't keeping the chain of cause and effect connected, it would cease to exist. Decisions only lead to outcomes because God has decided that they shall continue to do so. Or think of it like this. You can say it like this. God sovereignly wills your responsibility. So embrace responsibility. Strive for holiness. Work for the goal of your heavenly calling. Serve King Jesus with all your might. Accept responsibility. Thirdly, adore passionately. Incomprehension is a prerequisite of passionate praise. Let me say it one more time. Incomprehension is a prerequisite of passionate praise. When your favorite sports star pulls off an amazing play, you don't know how they did it. You don't stress out about it. You shout about it out loud. When a musician executes a complicated virtuoso line, you don't have to comprehend it to greatly enjoy it. We praise and worship that which induces wonder. God's ways are higher than our ways. Sometimes I can glimpse something he's done in a way I could have never mapped out or imagined. And always, I can look back to the cross and I can see the greatest thing he's done in a way that you and I would never have planned or even known to ask for. Comprehension is not a prerequisite for wonder, but wonder is a prerequisite for worship. So in any circumstance, adore him passionately. His goodness is never in doubt, only our ability to comprehend his good plans. Melissa Kruger says this. She says, as I study the complexities of God, I'm forced to remember and reflect upon the limitations of my own nature. I am a finite being trying to understand an infinite God. Just because, listen, just because I do not understand how something can be so does not mean it is not so. It simply means my understanding is insufficient. Surely God can be and act in ways outside of our ability to comprehend. As Paul rightly questions, for who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? She says, reading passages in Proverbs 16 and others like them, Reminds me to be patient with mystery. I can hold these truths in the balance, experiencing great comfort in them both. My own responsibility for my actions causes me to rejoice all the more in the grace of God and the perfect righteousness that I'm unable to attain, he freely gives. God's sovereignty, she says, allows me to trust in the promises of God. If one iota of the universe was outside his domain, you and I could not rest secure. As theologian R.C. Sproul once said, if there's one single molecule in this universe running around loose, totally free of God's sovereignty, then we have no guarantee that a single promise of God will ever be fulfilled. However, God declares that he reigns over all. His promises are true. Not one circumstance can happen to us that is outside of his good plan for our lives. Is that mysterious? You bet it is. Is that incomprehensible? Of course it is. Is it wonderful? In every way. One more verse to look at in Proverbs 16. Let's, uh, let's read this out loud together. Let's read it out loud. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Now just read that again to yourself, because I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet this. That doesn't say what you think it says. See, you think it says, commit your plans to the Lord, and whatever you do will succeed. This is really saying the opposite. This is saying commit your ways to the Lord. Commit yourself to the Lord and you will become more and more of a person who makes wise, successful plans. The word commit in this verse means to roll over onto, to put all of your weight down on. This is saying unconditionally trust God for all the things that happen in your life and you will slowly and surely become a person who makes wise plans. Listen, God doesn't necessarily give guidance. He is guidance. Jesus doesn't just show you the way. He is the way. Give yourself to him. Commit your ways to him, all your ways, and you will become a wise person who's neither paralyzed by anxiety or passively inactive, but one who is at peace, that your choices matter and that your God is in charge. 
Bow your heads with me. Lake County online, bow your heads. Just a simple prayer I ran across. Let me share it with you. Lord, you call us to be careful, painstaking, doing diligence in all things. And you assure us that it's all under your sovereignty and according to your plan. Strengthen awareness in my mind and my heart for both the solemn responsibility that you've given us and the wonderful assurance that you are ultimately and always in charge. We cannot live well without both. In the name of Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life, we pray. Amen.